Sonic, the heart of your system. I'm Leo Warder for Kit Guru. When I review motherboards such as this Asus ROG Strix Z390i Gaming, I use my Panasonic GH5. But today I'm not talking about motherboards, I'm talking about cameras, specifically that camera there, which is the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera 4K. Initial impressions of the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera 4K, apart from the fact it's a very wordy name, is that it is actually rather larger than you might expect for something called Pocket, and that's because of the fixed 5-inch screen on the back. Essentially, they put a mobile phone on the back, therefore it is inevitably rather large. Pocket? No. The other impression is that the construction is somewhat plasticky. Now, in fairness to Blackmagic, they actually say it is a carbon fibre polycarbonate composite body which makes it lightweight, portable and durable. I don't know about the durable, I'm not going to try dropping it to see what happens. Lightweight? Yeah, reasonably so. I mean, it's not super heavy, uh, but compared to a GH5, I'd say there's nothing to choose between them. And uh, portable? Well, yeah, okay. I mean, you can put it in your bag, no trouble whatsoever, so I can't argue with any of those points. Nonetheless, it does feel plasticky. On the other hand, it is undeniably cheap. Depending on where you shop, 1150 to 1300 pounds for the body, and that is cheap. That's also part of the reason why I'm using my own Panasonic 25mm f1.7 lens that cost me, I think, £120, rather than the SLR Magic 25mm T.95 that was actually supplied with the review kit, because that's more like £500. It seems somewhat uh, disproportionate to put that lens on that camera. The object of the exercise here is to investigate how well you can do 4K60 video on the cheap. Uh, in terms of size, just to reiterate, so this is a four-third sensor and micro four-third lens. This is my old G6, which is micro four-thirds uh, and is just by comparison absolute tiddler. Now the G6 is certainly smaller than the GH, no toys about it, but it's not night and day, it is just a bit smaller. This, relatively speaking, is a monster. So, pocket no. Anyway, that's uh, splitting hairs. Let's look at the ports and connectors. There's a fair amount to see. It is worth pointing out uh, the camera is vented because it has active cooling. It is very quiet. You can't hear it when it's uh, working. However, you can feel the uh, warm air rushing out. Uh, here we have an aftermarket LPE6 battery. We were sent two of them in the review kit. Uh, it does get through batteries. Uh, I didn't see an hour from a battery. Mind you, I'm one of these sorts of paranoid types who doesn't like to see the battery drop much below half. Uh, so uh, we'll come to the mains power momentarily. Uh, on uh, this side, under this flap here, we've got uh, dual card slots. There, SD. There, CFAST 2. Uh, both supplied again as review kit, uh, Angel Bird. Getting um, the hatch open to get the cards out instantly on the tripod, you're likely to knock your tripod. If you want to do repeat shots, I actually found I was leaving the flap open while I was working, just as an observation. Uh, on this side, we have some of the world's most annoying rubber covers uh, because this one keeps popping out. See? Doesn't want to know. Okay, so there we have mic and headphone mini jacks. There we have a full-size HDMI, obviously connecting to a monitor or an external recorder. Here we have power, USB, and audio. These are interesting. So the USB in question is a Type-C, such as you would uh, use if you're using a, an external SSD, such as, again, 2 gig of Angelbird SSD supplied in the review kit. For the audio, we have... Uh, get that cover out of the way so you, can, so you can see what I'm doing. All these covers. What was that, fifth time lucky? Okay, so we have Mini XLR, which now gives you a full XLR. Uh, there's an option in the menus to uh, enable phantom power. So that gives you proper audio options. Pull the detent, pull the cable, there we go. Okay, so we've got XLR, we've got Mini Jack, and we've got four built-in microphones. Many, many audio options. And then we have power, another tiddly little doohickey that plugs in Day tent goes up. See so if we can do that with less drama. 
There we go, and that's now connected, and now we can run on mains power. Obviously, that's for in the studio rather than out and about. Nonetheless, a good thing, and we pull the collar and away. And then let's just for a laugh see if we can put these uh, covers back in place. I don't think it's ever going to happen, but you might as well share my pain. Oh, goodness, they are frustrating. Ignore that. Uh, control buttons on the top, we'll come to those when we're doing the setup. Uh, we've got two record buttons. Again, this is a movie camera, okay? Every, it's in the name. It's not a stills camera, although you do have a stills button. You can literally take stills, but it is for movie. This is allegedly for if you're doing the kind of vlog sort of thing, and you want to hold the camera like so, which is most unlikely because the screen is fixed. Uh, and then we have... Uh, top and bottom we have a quarter inch thread, uh, so obviously tripod, but if you want to rig the thing in some way, shape or form, either a top handle or more likely an arm for an external monitor, that's your fella there. The five inch touchscreen dominates the back of the camera. No viewfinder, you're doing everything with the screen. Let's turn it on. One, two, three, and we go. Let's just muck up the focus. Hit the autofocus button. It's not continuous autofocus, it is uh, just autofocus. So if you want to refocus, you're hitting that button quite a bit. And you can't tap on the screen to do the job. Go into the menu. And we have the tabs across the top and then little dots demonstrate how many uh, screens there are, as it were. So record, there are three screens to go through. So I'm shooting in ProRes LT at Ultra HD rather than Cinematic 4K or indeed uh, HD. You need quite a lot of storage. Uh, with a 256 gigabyte uh, CFast card at 60 FPS, if you're going to the one extreme of RAW, you can get seven minutes out of it. In LT there, I'm getting 40 minutes. If I was to go to proxy, I'll get 92 minutes. So a huge range. Go across there, you can see the settings that I've chosen. Uh, these dynamic range settings are interesting. Essentially, these two are quite similar to each other. That fellow there, film, is more kind of log-esque. And down here we have which card we're going to shoot to. And that's all fairly self-explanatory. Go to monitor. Monitor is a little bit confusing to me. Uh, so I've got focus assist on. Okay, that's straightforward enough. But I don't have anything I can do. It's simply on or off. So if I turn it off, and you'll note now the scene's all uh, regular. Go back, put the focus assist on. And it's green. Okay. If I go across to both, and I don't have anything connected to HDMI, so the HDMI function shouldn't play any part in this, but both is... Uh, here we go. So uh, focus assist is coloured lines, and I've chosen green. And if I go now to red, it will be red. Let's go to blue. Uh, so that is not completely intuitive. And then we can go across to the next screen and we have uh, the grid that we can use. Uh, it doesn't appear to be an option for a simple horizontal line, uh, which is slightly annoying when you're trying to get everything level. Audio, we're currently uh, using the camera's uh, microphones. Earlier I was using uh, XLR, which you do like thus. And now it's all gone quiet because of course I don't have anything plugged into XLR. Go back to camera mono. Now the thing is, here we have meters. On the screen itself, you notice now the focus peaking has gone to a blue, whereas previously it's green. Uh, I don't have any audio meters. You'll also notice that the SD card has vanished. I've had that happen a few times. Pop open the cover, pop out the card, pop the card back in, the card reappears. Having said that, this is a press sample, so goodness knows what abuse it's been subject to. Uh, so that's the audio, that's the input, that's the meters, that's your setting your levels. Setup. Setup, we've got four screens. So this is date and time in the usual way. And uh, I'm choosing shutter angle at the moment. I'm running shutter angle rather than shutter speed. Uh, there we have the options for the preset buttons, the functions one, two, three. What do you want each one to do? do uh, so function one is iris, function two is white balance. Function 3 is ISO, but you, you can move them around as you see fit. Uh, keep going across. 
uh, running uh, software version 5.2. I believe there's a beta, might even be beta 6 available at the moment, but I didn't update the camera. This is annoying. So you've got Bluetooth, but uh, the, in the intention is that you control the camera using an iPad. Uh, iOS only, and I think specifically iPad even, they don't even talk about sort of iPhone. Uh, if you're Android, as I am, there's nothing for you. Presets, I don't have any presets set. LUTs, there are four LUTs baked in. Uh, if you go back, you might think that I'm currently using uh, this LUT here, but I'm not, because you have to actually touch it to kind of engage it. And if you choose, you can drop more LUTs onto the root of your uh, memory card, and then you'll use that LUT instead. DaVinci obviously is very heavy on LUTs, we know this. Uh, but I, frankly, want to shoot quick and dirty uh, and convenient. When I started using the Pocket Cinema 4K, I was quite surprised, quite disappointed by the video I was getting. I set the white balanced in this environment under the white LED lights to 5500K and the image was practically sepia. I don't understand what happened there. There's a, an auto white balance function you can also use. That simply didn't work for me at all. Uh, neither did it work when I used it against um, a grey or a white target. Uh, in each case, the colour was just wrong. Uh, when I manually set white balance, I moved it from 5500 to 3600. The image went from sepia to almost blue. Moved it back to around about 4000, which is what I'm using, uh, I have been using rather, and I was happy with that. Uh, it's definitely different to the Panasonic, but I wouldn't say that it's wrong. Uh, so that was my solution, but why I had to muck around picking numbers that seemed approximately correct, I really don't understand. Uh, I took the camera around the garden for a walk, also took it off to see the ducks, get some uh, sort of scenic shots on the water, reflection and such like. It's November, uh, there was no sunlight, it was all overcast, but it was sort of that white overcast rather than grey overcast, uh, quite dim, and I, I could move the ISO around as I saw fit, and I could brighten it up or darken it down, uh, and I was happy. In fact, the uh, Pocket, 4, Pocket Cinema 4K, the images were, to my eyes, less noisy than the uh, GA. H5. I use the 25mm uh, f1.7, uh, outdoors I was shooting at f8, um, I also use the 1235 zoom, uh, also set that to around at f6, uh, the exact numbers will be on the bits of footage, and I, I, I was perfectly happy. I wouldn't like to say that I was more happy with either the Pocket Cinema 4K or the Panasonic, they both did a very similar job, both very usable, uh, they, they have their strengths and their weaknesses. Uh, so. That was a result. On the other hand, I took the uh, Pocket Cinema 4K in the house and did some uh, shots just did inside to see how it behaved. An absolute weakness of the Panasonic's, as we all know, is low light performance, and I was keen to see how that behaved. Under the house lights, which are to its mains power, obviously, uh, the, uh, all the bulbs in the house now are LED, and the lights were strobing like crazy. Absolutely unusable. Um, and there doesn't seem to be a sort of a, a flicker adjustment setting in the menus. I had a word with black magic and doesn't appear to be the case. So these uh, mains powered lights, which obviously have little uh, transformers in them, absolutely fine. Outdoors in daylight, absolutely fine. Uh, under house lights, terrible. Now I've, we've all seen that happen before with cameras. Uh, it's, it's no great surprise, uh, but you like to think you can just uh, change a synchro adjustment or some such and just you know, fix it. Uh, but it, it appeared to be a fundamental problem with the Pocket Cinema 4K. So uh, that, for me, was a problem. It's not an environment I take, uh, do video in, but I, I have done video indoors in the past, in the house, in, uh, rather than in this studio, uh, and I haven't had fundamental problems. With the Pocket Cinema 4K, I did. Uh, I can only report what happens. So overall, I was, I, I know for a fact before I got this camera, I wanted to like it. And I think part of the reason I wanted to like it was I'm not best pleased by the way that Panasonic has been upping the prices of their Micro Four Thirds cameras. So uh, the GH4 was 700 pounds the body, GH5 was 1500. Uh, is it double the camera? Well, provided you earn any money from it, it's not really a problem, but it, it, it's it's a significant increase. And obviously we know that Sony and others are, are now charging uh, significant money for the A7s and such like. 
and we know that the various full frame models that are coming out now, those prices are going up as well. The next Panasonic's repute three grand, isn't it? And goodness knows what those uh, L mount lenses are going to be. So like that. So the idea that Blackmagic can bring out a camera that's in the 1150 to 1300 territory for the body um, with uh, micro four thirds lenses that are a known quantity and you get XLR uh, as part of the package, that is absolutely welcome. I'm not particularly surprised it has quirks or limitations. Which would it be? Uh, I'm going to go with quirks uh, because the low light performance of Panasonic Micro Four Thirds is an absolute limitation. The fact this has dual native ISO and you can bump up the settings without it getting all horrible and noisy. In actual fact, this camera I wanted uh, at some points. I was considering using, um, you know, should I put an ND filter on it? Uh, it was too bright. I wanted to. You know, but instead I just stopped it down to f8 and, and that was the alternate way of doing it. Uh, instead I was much more interested in what was going on with the uh, focus peaking and such like and I was finding myself turning it on and off because I was looking at the image and I just couldn't tell if the white balance was halfway correct uh, because obviously the entire scene is covered in green or blue or whatever as you saw when I was going through the menus. So uh, it was use that, turn it off, turn it off. Now I didn't find a way of toggling that on and off on one of the quick function buttons. See in and out of the menu all the time. Toggle, 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 toggle. Having said that, the touch screen is superb. That five inch screen is absolutely epic. Uh, the speed it works at Perhaps if I had an iPad and I was linked over Bluetooth and I was you know, controlling it off that, it'd be again a different view. Uh, but working with the camera on a tripod, with the screen out of sight when I was you know, in front of the camera or when I was behind the camera looking at it going tap, 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 tap. Uh, it, it's a wholly different user experience. If I had somebody, you know, a director of uh, photography over there doing all the work, well, different story again. So it very much depends on how you're using the camera. Similarly, the business about battery life. Battery life is not shocking, but it, it is somewhat surprising as you're setting up the menus and such like and watching the battery bar start to drop. You know, you start the 100% battery, before you press the red button, you're going to have some black on the bar. It, it's just as sure as eggs, and that's a spooky thing to see. So it has many strengths. Blackmagic has certainly produced a, an impressive camera and an interesting camera and the fact they're doing 4K60 at that low low price is absolutely welcome. The uh, four third sensor is doing a really good job, the ISO works, uh, the white balance I don't get it. I mean my inclination is to say could they please fix the white balance and the response very likely is going to be no get DaVinci running fix it in post. The thing is there might be occasions where you want to fettle your footage fettle your footage. I must patent or trademark that saying. Uh, however, most of us most of the time want to just have it right out of the camera. It should just be right and if you need to then adjust things to fix a problem, well okay. But uh, this camera doesn't seem to want to deliver that. It's delivering footage that's kind of flattish and loggish. Uh, file size is another problem for me. Uh, the way KitGuru typically works is that I process my own footage, put it through Premiere, do some stuff, send it off to a guy um, who then does further stuff, titles and such like, and it gets uploaded to YouTube. And that has uh, two distinct points. The first being is the file size is six times larger than the GH5. Now the GH5 files, once they go through Premiere, they get to uh, they get crushed down quite significantly. Uh, they start life as a, a gigabyte a minute and they end up significantly smaller. Um, and we don't seem to lose any detail when we're doing that. We, we have quite beefy PCs processing the files. Uh, and then you send it off online. So the file size you're sending off, that's significant to us. I typically send off four or five gigabyte files and they take an hour to two to upload. Uh, if you're working in raw files in particular, but if you're working in any of the native file formats and you just want to send them off from the camera uh, to be worked on by some remote colleague, uh, you're going to be defeated. You, I think you're going to end up sending SSDs through the post. Uh, it, they're that large. If on the other hand you're working either doing it all yourself or you're sending files across a network, that's a completely different story. You have to start wondering how much storage you're going to need because you'll be crunching terabytes of hard drive space, that's for sure. But that's <laughs> that's just money. You, know, you just buy another 10 terabyte drive and move on, don't you? Um, being about 
300 pounds these days. Uh, so that that's just a, a, a cost of ownership if you're working in that way. Uh, if you want smallish file sizes that you can uh, manipulate relatively easily and transmit back and forth to remote colleagues, this camera might be a problem to you, but then that's true of most every uh, raw format. Uh, and of course, it has to be said, uh, if you're ending up putting your videos on YouTube, as so many people are, as Kit Guru does, then we all know that uh, YouTube processes the backside out of files. So that little bit of extra nuance and colour and detail and so on and so forth, and the extra dynamic range, they'll crush all that to pieces. We all know that. Uh, so this camera has huge potential. It's certainly of interest, to, it should be of interest to anybody who's working under controlled lighting. Uh, that will uh, sort any flicker absolutely, just as this isn't flickering. Uh, you need to sort out your white balance to the best of your abilities. That annoys me. Pretty much every other aspect of it I like a great deal. The precise nature of the uh, how the menus work and such like, uh, there's a lot of good. Blackmagic's done some really good work with their software. The biggest single problem for me working alone is that the screen is fixed. That is a real pain. You don't have to be a vlogger to want to be able to see what the heck's going on now. Obviously, it's got a thread on the top. You can put an arm on it. You can put a monitor on it. You've got HDMI. You can rig it. You can do... There are ways around this, but that all adds expense. A major bonus of this camera is it's cheap, cheap, cheap. If you're a student and you want to start to learn how to do video and you don't want to spend an absolute fortune, this camera is a, an amazing way into that trade. Absolutely formidable. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up. If you don't, well, okay, give it a thumbs down. Look around, there's a bell button. That'll alert you to new videos on KitGuru as they become available. Typically, we do PC stuff, but this, in this instance, is a camera. It's the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera 4K, and I'm Leo Warder for KitGuru.